Perfect. Thank you. We, we will start again. Good afternoon, Asia, and good morning to our friends in Europe. Greetings from the Asia Europe Foundation. We are here in Singapore, and thank you so much for joining us today for a public conversation about Asia Europe relations with the one and only Ambassador at Large, Tomi Ko. My name is Fatima from the ASAF Communications team. Before we begin, just a few guidelines. Some of you are joining us on Zoom, while some of you are watching via YouTube live stream. For those with us on Zoom, please note that for the entire duration of the webinar, your cameras will be turned off and your microphones will also be muted. At any point though, you may submit your questions for Ambassador Co using the Q&A option available on Zoom. For those watching on YouTube, you might also submit questions for Ambassador Co at any time during the webinar using the live chat function available. ASEF staff will be monitoring both streams and we will collate your questions. Uh, we would like to request everyone asking questions to please kindly indicate your name and where you are from so we can acknowledge you when we read out your questions. Ambassador Ko will be in conversation with Mr. Lawrence Anderson, Director of ASEF's Communications Department. Before, immediately before his secondment with us here at ASEF, Mr. Anderson was the Ambassador of Singapore to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Kingdom of Bahrain. So without further ado, let us begin. Mr. Anderson, the floor is yours. Welcome everyone to the Meet Our ASEF Family and Friends series. Our topic this evening is on Asia-Europe relations. To discuss this, we are privileged to have with us someone who really needs no introduction, but I will introduce him anyway, because some of you might not be aware of the range of his distinguished service to his nation and to the world at large. Most of all, because he has been for over 30 years, my boss, <laughs> my mentor, and my friend. Tommy Cole is currently Professor of Law at the National University of Singapore, NUS, and Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is Director of the Tembusu College at NUS, Chairman of the Governing Board of the Center of International Law at NUS, and the Co-Chairman of the Asian Development Bank's Advisory Committee on Water and Sanitation. His postings include having served as Singapore's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, ambassador to the United States of America, where he was my boss in the late 1980s, high commissioner to Canada and ambassador to Mexico. He was Singapore's chief negotiator to secure the agreement to establish diplomatic relations between Singapore and China. He was also Singapore's chief negotiator for the US-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Ambassador Ko's services have extended beyond Singapore's borders. He was president of the third UN Conference on the Law of the Sea that led to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea UNCLOS. He was chairman of the main committee of the UN Conference on Environment and Development, the Earth Summit, which produced conventions dealing with climate change, biodiversity, and forestry. He was also the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy, who brokered the successful disengagement of Russian military forces from the Baltic states at the end of the Cold War. Relevant to today's discussion on Asia-Europe relations, Tommy Koh was the founding executive director of the Asia-Europe Foundation, or ASEF, when it was set up in Singapore in 1997, a year after the establishment of the Asia-Europe meeting, or ASEM. Now, after what must be the longest introduction of a distinguished guest on record, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tommy Ko to the interview. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. Ambassador Ko, those must have been heady days with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. I remember well, there were so many expectations of a better world for all and a great desire of nations and peoples from different regions to interact and get to know each other better. You were, so to speak, at the center of this amazing time in history, present at the creation of the Asia-Europe meeting. 
what are your recollections of how ASEM was born? Um, the Prime Minister of Singapore, Go Chok Tong, had a vision in 1994. His vision was that he wanted to build a bridge linking Asia and Europe. He felt that this was a gap in the world order. You have many linkages between America and Europe. There are growing links between Asia and America, but there were no links between Asia and Europe. So this is his vision. And he went to Davos in 1995 to lay out his proposal. So it was warmly received and resulted a year later in a historic meeting in Bangkok in March 1996, when 10 Asian leaders met with 16 European leaders and decided to institutionalize the Asia-Europe meeting. Well, one of the outcomes of the first ASEM meeting was to set up the Asia-Europe Foundation. Yeah. ASEF is to date the only institution of the ASEM process. Now, can you tell us in your own words, how did ASEF come about? Yeah. And what role did you play? <laughs> you play personally in its inception. I think, I think the leaders of the two sides agreed that this engagement must be comprehensive. It must involve the government, the private sector, and the civil society. They felt it's important for the peoples of Asia and Europe to understand the relevance and usefulness of this new engagement. So the leaders in Bangkok decided to set up a foundation to promote better mutual understanding the peoples of Asia and Europe. And that's how ASEM was born. Mm. Um, I was given the mandate uh, in May 1996 to negotiate an agreement between the 16 countries. Uh, it wasn't easy because there were many differences of views on whether you need an international agreement to establish a foundation or it should be incorporated under Singapore law. Um, there were disagreement about how the financial contribution should be made. Should it be obligatory or optional, you know, voluntary? Uh, and what are the principles that will govern the new foundation? Uh, I remember when I went to Brussels, um, my friends in the European Commission told me that it normally takes two years to establish any new institution. Two years. <laughs> two years. So I told my interlocutors in Brussels that my boss in Singapore, Kishon Babubani, wanted it done in six months. <laughs> and that there was going to be an inaugural meeting of the governors of ASEF in Singapore in February 1997. So we had to get an agreement and establish the foundation in good time. So um, after a lot of consultation, negotiation, we finally came to an agreement at a senior meeting in Dublin in December 1996. Mm -hmm. And this was done by way of adopting the so-called Dublin Principle. You know, once a Dublin Principle was adopted, then we have a principle that govern the birth and life of the foundation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, it sounds like ASEF had some difficult birth pains, but fortunately, you know, due to your normal charm and your, your pleasant over. But so what were some of the major challenges you faced in steering ASEF to achieve its goals now? Um, first, I had to prove the relevance of the new engagement. I had to convince the people in Asia why Europe is important to us, to our present and our future, and why we should invest time and energy in this engagement. At the same time, we must convince the Asians to overcome their post-colonial hangovers and to look at the new Europe, not as the former colonial master, but as co-equal, you know. Then we began the journey of building these new connections between Asia and Europe through cultural exchanges, through intellectual exchanges, people-to-people -people exchanges, to mobilizing the power of the media and the communications industry. So I think I was executive director for 
nearly four years, and uh, it was a very busy period of time. But I look back on it as a very wonderful period of my life. Well, it sounds certainly that you had an illustrious term as the first ASF governor. But can you tell us what are the achievements that you are most proud of? And were there any disappointments or things perhaps you wish that you could have done differently? Uh, <clears throat> in the beginning, our team was extremely small, you know, and uh, our budget was also limited. So we made a strategic decision that we will not be a grant giving foundation. This is a great disappointment to a lot of academics who are hoping to get money from the foundation. We decided to use our money as seed money to fund, to co-fund projects which are important to, to the foundation. And we began to um, do some important things which have endured. For example, we started a summer school, bringing university students from the two regions together. And I think it's now being complemented by a winter school where, where the meetings are in, in Asia. You know? yes. uh, we brought young parliamentarians together. We, we, we try to explain each country, the development in each country to the other country. For example, when the Europeans conceived uh, monetary union and gave birth to the euro. I think most countries in Asia were not aware of the significance of the birth of euro. So we put on road shows in Singapore, in, in China, in Hong Kong, to explain what is the significance of euro and its relevance to, to the countries in Asia. When the Asia financial crisis occurred in 1997, many people in Europe wonder whether this is the end of the Asian miracle, you know? So we had to go to Europe to explain that, that there were some problems. Government wasn't great, good enough, but we learned our lesson and Asia will rise again. And sure enough, two years after the crisis, Asia rose again, you know? So we, we tried to be useful in explaining important developments in each region to the others. We tried to, uh, in, in that way, to promote better mutual understanding. We try to bring young people together, to study together, to, to go on journeys together, to make music together, to, to make art together. Hmm. Well, sounds very interesting, but can you perhaps uh, enlighten us a little bit about maybe some of the difficulties in terms of negotiating with different people from different groups? I know your experience at the UN came in uh, was very useful for this, but it must have been tough with having so many different people from Europe and from Asia with different perceptions, experiences, historical uh, differences, different ways of governing, to come together and to reach understanding and agreement on some of the difficult topics. Um, well, actually, the most sensitive topic was human rights. Mm. You know? So the question is, how can Asians and Europe, Europeans discuss human rights? Uh, in a comfortable setting, without finger pointing, but with a genuine wish to understand the other side's perspective. Mm -hmm. So the first Asia-Europe colloquium on human rights was held in Finland in December 1997. I attended this meeting, and it was a very good meeting. It's a wonderful start. Because at this meeting, the European speakers were not trying to point fingers at the Asian, you know. In fact, they were being so critical oh. and say that, you know, although we are proud of our achievement, but there are many shortcomings still on the European side. And they, 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 they frankly told, told us, for example, and, and this was a big surprise to us, they said that there's human trafficking in Europe. Uh, a lot of Asian women were illegally imported to Europe to service the sex industry. Minorities were often treated unfairly and so on. So the Europeans were being self-critical. And I think by being self-critical, it gave the good impression to the Asian that we are not 
entering a forum in which the Europeans are the prosecutors and we are the accused, you know? Yes. So that gave me courage to propose something to the Europeans, which is that in future colloquia, it shouldn't be co-chaired by two Europeans, but we should bring in two Asians to join the two Europeans. And I persuaded China and Indonesia to agree to join France and Finland to co-chair this colloquium. Mm. And to my happy surprise, I managed to persuade China to host the second human rights colloquium in Beijing, you know? And we had a wonderful and very frank discussion about, about human rights in China, minority rights, and so on, you know? Well, fantastic, you know? I Human rights is still a very sensitive and a very, uh, but still a very relevant issue to be discussed. Maybe they should engage you again, <laughs> Ambassador Ko, to do some of these things. Yes. But what about other issues that you felt were a bit more easier flowing, but you felt that they were also very significant in terms of the times that you were there as ASEAN director? Uh, you know, after the Asian financial crisis in 97, um, some of my European friends wondered whether the Asians will rise again mm. or are they seeing the end of the Asian miracle? So we had to reassure them that, that we will rise again and this engagement between Asia and Europe remains valid and important and has a bright future. Yes. The other, the other thing is basically to overcome ignorance on both sides, you know. Europeans then were ignorant of modern Asia. In the same way I say, the Asians were ignorant of modern Europe. Mm. So our job was to make each side more knowledgeable about the other. Yes. Yeah? yes. And to overcome centuries of prejudice and stereotypes, you know. I think it was fortunate also that, that, that during that period, perhaps both sides really wanted to learn from each other because for so long, the Cold War had kept them all separate. Well, it's not just Cold War, but you, you remember you, the historical engagement of Asia and Europe go back centuries. Yes. Yeah? But during the 18th and 19th century, um, most of the countries in Asia came under the dominance of European colonial masters. Yes, an unequal relationship. Yeah. And and it, it's only in the 20th century that they became a free and independent country. In, in the beginning, there was some weariness on the part of Asians about engaging their former colonial master. Mm -hmm. But we explained to the Asians that this is a new world, you know? <laughs> this is no longer a world dominated by the European and the Asians as inferior. This is a new world of an engagement between two equals. Yes. Yeah? At the same time, we have to explain to the Europeans that Asia is no longer the poor and backward region that you, you, it used to be. That Asia is in the rise, Asia becoming more and more prosperous, more modern, uh, and Asia will become more and more relevant to you, European. Yeah. Yes. And it seems that both sides have learned a lot yeah. about it. And something that we will touch on in the second part of our series, and this will be a good time actually for us to have a short walk yeah. through some of Ambassador Ko's career assignments.
welcome back, everyone. Ambassador Ko, that must have been brought back many pleasant memories to you. Well, so far we've touched on ASEF. Now I'd like to broaden the scope to Asia-Europe relations and discuss the present and the future. What do you think or what do you see are the top priorities for Asia and Europe in a highly globalized world? And what is the relevance of ASEM today? We face three great challenges in today's world. A health crisis, an economic crisis, and a crisis of international governance. I think there's an opportunity for the leaders of Asia and Europe to work together to overcome all three crises. So on the health crisis, I hope the Asian and European countries will agree to encourage their scientists and doctors to collaborate, to find cures and vaccines for COVID-19. And importantly, when cures and vaccines are discovered, to make them international public goods yes. so that they are affordable and accessible to the peoples, not just of our two regions, but to the world. You know? So that's the health crisis. I think we are entering a major global recession. And I think that we should work with each other, to see how we can help our economy to recover. But in order to recover, we must impose barriers against each other. You know, we mustn't, in the post-COVID world, limit opportunities for our traders, our business people, our entrepreneurs. We should keep our markets open, keep our ports open, encourage young people to take advantage of the new opportunities, especially in the digital economy, you know. So I think the second important thing Asia and Europe can do is to work together to help our two regions to exit the global recession and to embark on the recovery process. Yes. The third challenge, it's a challenge to international governance. It is very ironical that a country which was the principal post-World War II architect of the systems of international governance have now turned it back on the system. So multilateralism is in crisis. Multilateral institutions like the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization are in crisis. I think what the leaders of Asia and Europe can do is to grow strengths, stand together and support multilateralism, support free trade, support globalization, support important institutions like WHO and w, uh, WTO. Yes, I think you wouldn't find anyone in Asia and Europe quarreling with all those points that you have made. But you have also pointed to a third party, a third party that needs to be persuaded and brought into yeah. the fold. And it could so easily be the other way around that the person may feel, or the, the country may feel ganged up against yeah. between Asia and Europe. What sort of advice do you think you would give to perhaps find ways to bring all three parties together rather than to pitting two <laughs> against one? It's a bit sensitive, but it's, it's relevant, I think. I, I think we must continue to try to engage this important country, not to isolate it, and not to demonize it, you know, not to demonize it. Yes. Um, in the case of Singapore, we continue to have very good and close relations with this country. Mm. Yeah. We may disagree on the merit or demerit of free trade, merit or demerit of multilateralism, but we don't allow these differences, sectoral differences, to poison the overall relationship. So it's important that, uh, and you know, things change, government change, so we must always hope that um, the future will bring about a change in the attitude of this important country towards these issues. Yes. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, differences exist everywhere, even within families, but that doesn't mean we want to split or anything, especially in our in 
globalized societies, we find that we are all interdependent. We can't solve things on our own. We need to work together. So I think you have brought up very relevant issues over there. But um, from our discussion, we can see how ASEM has brought together Asia and Europe. And in this increasingly interdependent world, wrecked by pandemics, conflicts in many areas, you know, you've alluded to some of the issues which ASEM can play a useful role. So I'd like to take, up, take you up on this about expanding this relevant role for, Asia, for ASEM in engaging, in engaging third countries or regions. You know, you've uh, alluded to the question of the Americans or the, yeah. the United States. Do you see this role also extending perhaps to other regions as well? What, what Asia it, and Europe basically engaging other, a third region, whether it's the Middle East, Latin America, in other places. In other words, to bring everybody or more people together to understand what multi, multilateral uh, issues are like and how we all need to work together. My first priority, my first priority is to strengthen ASEM. You know, if ASEM is not strong, there's not very much ASEM can contribute to others. Mm -hmm. ASEM must be strong. Yes. And after all, we work in many multilateral institutions like UN, WTO, NHO, and in those forums, Asian and European countries and leaders seek common cause to help push things in the right direction, to counter efforts to subvert and undermine those institutions. You know, this moment of crisis is a moment for the leaders of Asia and Europe to make a difference. So my challenge to them is, why don't you rise to the occasion and show the world that ASEM is not just a talk shop, that it is a very important relationship between two important regions, two important civilizations. And in this moment of crisis, when global leadership is in short supply, mm -hmm. I appeal to the leaders of Asia and Europe to provide that leadership. Yes. Well, this is a ringing clarion call for Asian and European leaders come together. It's fascinating. And actually, I think it deserves maybe another webinar on this. <laughs> However, we are running out a bit of time. But I want to ask you one final question before we throw it open to the audience. We have talked about what ASEM can do in terms of um, moving forward on some of the issues and tackling yeah. the issues of the day. Well, ASEF will be celebrating its 20 fifth anniversary in 2022. So this time I want to ask about ASEF. So how can ASEF continue to make itself relevant for future generations? I think the first priority of ASEF <clears throat> is to make itself relevant and useful to ASEF, mm -hmm. you know, to mobilize the power of the civil society to support this grand agenda I suggested and to help resolve some of our global problems. Climate change being one. Yes. You know, the Paris Agreement on climate change is very important. And it is also under attack. So ASEM, ASEM must support the Paris Agreement and climate change. I think the whole sustainability agenda is important, you know. So I think ASEM and ASEM should support the UN Sustainable, sustainability goals, you know, yes. and make that an important agenda for our work. And I think we, we, we want to, we must also protect and strengthen the rule-based international order, both in politics and economics, which are also under challenge. Yes. You know. And would you have some great suggestions <laughs> on that in terms of it, this, how do we move forward on these things? I think the, the, the feeling is that we want to be relevant to all these things. Yeah. The difficulties now, and it's COVID-19, the pandemic has made it, of course, difficult because, you know, we cannot have physical meetings. But how should we, if you were able to do so, how, how would you share some of your past experiences in bringing groups and different peoples together on a broad area of uh, um, 
different issues, yeah. how to bring them together. I think the absence of fiscal meeting has been compensated by technology. Mm -hmm. So our current dialogue is on Zoom and, and YouTube. Yes. You know, we are all using technology to maintain contact, to, to conduct this course and so on. So by using technology, the leaders of Asia and Europe must move the agenda forward. They mustn't wait until COVID-19 crisis is over, you know? Yes. Yeah. We can do it. We can, with the help of the technology, we can do it. Yes. And we certainly, with this, again, another ringing clarion call, <laughs> we can now actually throw it the floor open to question and answers. So let me hand it over to Fatima, who has been diligently um, working with Linan to channel the, the questions from our attentive audience. So Fatima? Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Uh, is my audio okay this time? Perfect. The first two questions are from Ambassador Sumadi from Indonesia. Hello, Pak Sumadi, uh, our governor from Indonesia. Question one is, we all know that, that the original basic rationale of the creation of ASEM was connecting the disconnected dots of the geopolitical triangle, that is, Asia and Europe, completing the already connected transatlantic and transpacific now that the global geopolitical landscape has shifted and changed, do you think that this basic rationale still holds its relevance today? Okay, one of them. <laughs> Pasumadi, is that from Pasumadi? Pasumadi, yes. Pasumadi, uh, Pasumadi, thank you for asking your important question. <clears throat> I maintain that the vision that led us to the historic meeting in Bangkok in March 1996, remain valid. In this increasingly interdependent world, it is very important for Asians and Europeans to work together, not just in economics, not just in uh, politics, but in all aspects of life. And I think when international governance is being challenged and, and undermined, I think this is a golden opportunity for Asia and Europe to make a difference to the world, to supply this deficit of global leadership. So I would say to Pasumadi, I think the vision that led to the birth of ASEM in 96 and ASEM in 97 remain valid today. If anything, it's more valid than they were 20 plus years ago. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ko, for your, for your response. Uh, Paksumadi has a second question. And uh, the second question is, it is perceived that the current COVID-19 pandemic is, is causing deglobalization and people-to-people -people distancing. Facing such a phenomenon, how best can the Asia Europe Foundation fulfill its mandate of promoting people-to-people -people exchanges, friendship, cooperation, do you think that virtual communication can be a good substitute to people-to-people -to -people relationships? Well, the, the, the first point I want to make is that the COVID-19 pandemic is the most serious health emergency we have experienced in living memory. But it too will pass. It too will pass. If not this year, then next year. So, but in the meantime, while we are living with this pandemic, we mustn't give up. We must use technology to, to continue to enable us to work, to meet each other, to discuss important projects, to push the envelope, to, to fight against reactionary forces that wish to undermine free trade, globalization, and, uh, in, and multilateralism. In the meantime, we must convince our own people that in a post-COVID-19 world, we mustn't turn inward and close our borders to people, to trade, to technology, to exchange. I think it's important that in a post-COVID-19 world, the world doesn't become protectionist. It must remain open and supporting 
free and fair trade. I think we want to, we want to also reduce a certain xenophobia that has arisen in many countries resulting from COVID-19, you know? So in the post-COVID-19 world, I think we want to reduce this xenophobia, the anti-foreign, anti-foreigner sentiment that we see in, in the current world. And, and most importantly, in the post-COVID-19 world, I want to encourage young people to travel again, to study in each other's country, to intern in each other's country, to do great, do great things together. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ko. The next two questions are from Elizabeth Galvez from the United Kingdom. And the question is, um, are you concerned about the apparent decline of multilateralism as a solution to global challenges? I've said that uh, there's a crisis, there's a crisis of international governance. I think that uh, multilateralism, important multilateral institutions like WHO, WTO are under attack. I think this is where I think there's an opportunity for Asia and Europe to work together to defend its, this institution, to defend multilateralism. We must not allow multilateralism to fail. Thank you very much, Ambassador. The next question is from Yeti van der, apologies, if I pronounce your name wrong, from Yeti van der Medhanning from the Center for Culture and Development in the Netherlands. Um, the question is, how can countries in Asia respond uh, through policy on arts and culture during the pandemic? How can countries in Asia respond in terms of cultural policy on arts and culture during this time of a pandemic? Um, <laughs> this question reminds me of a recent uh, development in Singapore. You know, public opinion poll was conducted and Singaporeans were asked, uh, what are the essential industries, uh, jobs, and what are the non-essential industries and jobs? And uh, the result of the poll, which caused a lot of happiness, is that the artist or the art worker is the number one non-essential job. Uh, I responded to it. I wrote an op-ed in the straight time to say this is so wrong, you know, but it's also understandable. When you do this poll in the middle of a pandemic, when lives are at stake, your priorities are different from normal time, you know? So naturally you say the doctor, the nurse, the healthcare worker, these are essential jobs. And you think, well, art is, it's a luxury. But I pointed out that people who say art and the art worker are non-essential forget that we maintain our sanity by reading books, listening to music, by looking at uh, programs on Netflix, TV. We listen to concerts on uh, Zoom and other devices. So the arts help to keep our psychological well-being, you know? I would maintain that art is very important to any nation's psychological, mental, moral health, you know. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ko. The next question is from uh, someone closer to home, uh, from Singapore, a uh, young student. Um, where is it? One second. Hi, Prof Ko. I'm Nurul Ain, a Singaporean taking my master's in Malay studies at the University of Malaya. Um, is there an opportunity or are there ways for, for, for me to share, share Malay expertise 
in Europe, will, there, will they be receptive to it in the first place? What are your thoughts on this? To answer. <laughs> Sorry, can you answer that question? <laughs> well, I think, of course, they would be very interested in learning about culture and, and about the Malay culture because it is a rich culture. It is a culture that transcends not just only our part of the world, but, you know, if you look at, say, South Africa, there is a community of Malays over there. If you look in the Middle East, they are familiar with this. And I think the Europeans would be open to this. Um, the only problem now, of course, is with, with uh, the pandemic. Travels and interactions are a bit more difficult, but you can always do it online. I, I would, I would um, add to what Lauren said by saying that, that the importance of Bahasa is undervalued by the world. It's a language spoken by Malaysia, where the students come from, by Indonesia, and by Brunei. It is a very significant population of the world. And, uh, and, and I think Indonesia is, is a very, very large, middle-sized country. There are some projections that uh, Indonesia could become the fifth largest economy in the world 50 years from now. So, in fact, I'm trying to encourage my own people in Singapore to, to study Bahasa. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, the next question is from a other, another young, young man um, from, from India, K.K. Malik uh, from India. In this difficult time, what are your thoughts about reopening tourism globally? Um, are, Reopening tourism, tourism, yes, in this difficult time. And what are your thoughts on this? And if you are um, agreeable to, to it, reopening tourism globally, what do you think are the kind of steps that uh, governments uh, sh should take in, in doing this? Too early for global tourism to, to come back um, because the pandemic is not over in many countries. Um, the, the number of persons afflicted with COVID-19 is on the rise or sometimes the second surge. So safety is number one. So if we want to open up, we must open up gradually and open up to other cities and other countries in which you have confidence and with which you can negotiate protocols. You know? So what Singapore has done is that we have negotiated reciprocal green lane for travel between Singapore and six provinces in China. We have we've now agreed in principle to do the same with Malaysia, but we are working out you know, some of the protocols that should be observed and by the travelers. So we will, we, gra we will gradually have more and more reciprocal green, green lane in addition to China and Malaysia with other countries. And our first priority will be ASEAN. I want to see the revival of intra-ASEAN tourism. Yeah. So that will be my number one priority and, and gradually expand that depending on the health situation in each of the countries and your ability to negotiate mutual agreements on what protocols observe. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. The next question is from, I will also mispronounce this for sure, uh, Saifuddin Samsuri. Um, not sure where you're from, sir, but uh, we got your question. Professor Ko, um, you proposed that the Asia-Europe Foundation could be relevant and useful to the Asia-Europe meeting process by, among other things, engaging and mobilizing civil society as global governance is now in short supply. But how would you convince uh, Asian countries to see and to accept civil society as a credible agent of change, of positive change, and not just political challenges to ruling establishments? 
it's, it's a mistake to think that uh, civil society is the opposition, you know, and, and some politicians have this mistaken belief that the civil society is, is our opponent or, or are out to obstruct us. This is wrong. Civil society um, is a positive force. You know, it helps governments to do things which government can't do. For example, in Singapore, a lot of the healthcare services are provided by voluntary, voluntary welfare organizations, VWOs. The Nature Society helped the government in promoting the green agenda, in uh, conducting tours to our nature reserves and other places. And, and if you look at the recent uh, problem with our foreign worker dormitories, the civil society played a very important role in helping the government to look after the foreign workers, looking after their health, we have an NGO called Health Surf, which provides health service to foreign workers. We have uh, another NGO, TWC2, which helps them in a material way and, and, and advocacy. So, so civil society must not be viewed by government as the enemy. It is not. The ideal situation we want, ideal situation we want, is a strong government strong private sector and strong civil society. Yes, if I could just yeah, add to sorry. that and perhaps um, pose another question. I think you, what you have said is absolutely right, um, Ambassador Ko, that <clears throat> basically governments should not look at civil society as the opposition. Yeah. And I think by and large, to be fair to governance, they, most governments do not no. look at uh, civil society yeah. in that form except for one particular area, perhaps the more political um, organizations. Um, would you say in dealing with them that perhaps if they took a less confrontational approach, both sides <laughs> taking a less confrontational approach and looking, because in some ways, both sides actually want the same thing, yeah. to better society, to better the people, and they could actually work together. Perhaps there is some sort of advice you would give um, both sides, as to how they can engage in a much more productive way like <laughs> other NGOs. But every country, every country is different. Every country is different. Every country has a different culture. In some countries, uh, protests are allowed. And protests often mobilize public opinion and bring about positive change. You know, I, I look back, I was a student in America in the early 1960s, when America was racially segregated, you know, and the civil rights movement, the protest movement, a non-violent movement, uh, brought about positive change. So it depends on each country, its situation. In the case of Singapore, pro protests are not allowed. Confrontation doesn't work. So the civil society here had to engage the government in a different way, you know? And uh, as I'm the patron of the Nature Society, I can say that, that the relationship between our Nature Society and government has gone through different phases. There was a period when it was very confrontational and was really not productive for either side, you know? Um, it has now become a much more cooperative relationship where there's a lot of mutual respect between the two sides. And by working together, we have been able to do many good things for nature and the environment. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. Um, for the next questions, uh, three questions, but they are all uh, related. So uh, if you don't mind. So, so we have questions from Su Yin Yap from Singapore. And, Sadman Faisal from Bangladesh. Oh. <laughs> and Dana Lee, a freshman in international relations in Japan. And the, the topic is uh, like intersections of crises and uh, pressing issues that are overshadowed. So Su Yin is asking you, Ambassador Ko, what do you think are the pressing issues in Asia and Europe that are currently overshadowed 
right now by COVID-19 and other bigger things. And um, Sadman from Bangladesh is saying, with all these intersections of, of crises like COVID-19 and climate change that are now existing together, uh, how can Asia and Europe come together to solve both and not like prioritize one over another, which is related to what Dana from Japan is saying, um, while the world is facing health crises and economic crises at the same time, how can governments balance both so that it can mitigate the effect to, to different countries? Um, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> a, bit, a, bit, a bit loaded, but uh, I thought they were all related. So. To, to reply to Suin, I would say that um, the COVID crisis and the economic crisis has naturally taken our eye away from other important problems and challenges. I think in Singapore, there's a, it, there's a great need for us to do something um, to reduce poverty and inequality. Yeah. And when we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, I hope we will remember that this is a very important challenge to Singapore. We have to reduce poverty, reduce inequality, ensure that there continue to be upward mobility, opportunities for kids from disadvantaged families, I would say. Um, my response to the other two questions is that, that we have to deal with both the COVID crisis and the economic crisis simultaneously. Obviously, the economic crisis was largely produced by the COVID crisis. Uh, but even in the midst of the pandemic, life must go on, you know? So if you take the case of Singapore, it was very important. And, and ASEAN, I would say take ASEAN collectively. ASEAN collectively have agreed that in spite of the pandemic, ASEAN will not turn inward. ASEAN will remain open to the world, that our airports and seaports will not be closed, that our markets will not be closed, and that we remain committed to our regional goals of building a single community in Southeast Asia. So I think COVID-19 notwithstanding, the ASEAN countries have wisely decided that we must keep our economy running, we must ensure that essential goods, including medical supplies, will continue to flow, um, that we remain open to the world, and, and we must, of course, take precaution to ensure the safety of our population, but to the extent possible, you know, we must be open to the world. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and I think we have, uh, we have time for four. Um, two more questions. Um, the next is from, from Vietnam, uh, from our governor from, from Vietnam. He says, uh, yes, 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 hello. Governor Duan Xuan Hung. And uh, so he says, as you mentioned earlier, Ambassador Ko, one of the three crises we face today is global governance. In your views, what are the possible solutions to overcome this challenge? And how can international fora like the Asia-Europe meeting, play a part in reshaping global governance? That's the first. I think, I think the crisis of international governance is just as important as the health crisis and the economic crisis. And I really think in this area, in the crisis of international governance, there's an opportunity for Asia and Europe to do something. I think there, must be, there should be an agreement between the leaders of our two regions to stand up and defend international cooperation, to stand up for multilateralism, and not to allow, not to allow the forces of darkness, <laughs> not, to, not to allow the forces of darkness to prevail in undermining international institutions like the World Health Organization or the World Trade Organization. I think we must protect 
and strengthen those institutions. Reform, yes, but to undermine them, no. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. And that's actually very good that you, you said uh, um, the World Health Organization because the next question is uh, precisely about that. Uh, the next question is about Dr. Ivana from France. Hello. Um, and she's asking, Ambassador Ko, what do you think of what do you think are the reforms needed in the World Health Organization and the United Nations to be more protective and effective based on what is seen with COVID-19 now? And how can um, organizations, um, let's say such as the ASEAN Foundation and, and other institutions help? Uh, I, I wouldn't talk about the UN because that's a big, that's a big one, but I will talk about WHO. WHO plays an indispensable role in the world. It is the international organization that collects data from all over the world. It monitors health uh, outbreaks. It brings together the best scientific brains to work together. WHO is indispensable to the world. And we mustn't allow the dark forces to, to undermine WHO. WHO is not perfect. And why is it not perfect? Because over the last few decades, the Western countries have progressively undermined WHO by cutting the, the funding. Today, if you look at the budget at the WHO today, only about 20% of the WHO's budget is contributed by assessed contribution of member states. You know, the rest has to be raised through voluntary contribution. This makes WHO, how do I say, um, vulnerable to pressures from donor countries. I think it was a, it was a strategic blunder on the part of the West to progressively undermine WHO's efficacy by reducing its uh, financial strength, you know? If, if the West truly believe in WHO, and here I want to challenge them. So I challenge my European brothers and sisters, if you believe in WHO, please agree to change the formula for funding WHO. The majority of the budget of WHO should come from member states, not voluntary contribution. In this way, WHO will be less beholden to donor countries and be more objective, you know? Thank you, Ambassador Thank you. Ko. We have a few more questions, and if no one minds, I will just uh, go, go on for a bit. Uh, the, the next question is from Daniel from Singapore. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Yeah. The COVID-19 crisis has hit countries and demographics who are particularly less well-off, especially hard, less well-off, especially hard, revealing deep-rooted inequalities. What do you think richer nations and demographics should do in a post-COVID-19 world to help these uh, poorer populations? I think in, in any crisis, the poor and the marginalized suffer more than others. You know, this is true in every crisis, it's true in this crisis. And, uh, and we need, this is where you need the civil society leaders to point out that there are these vulnerable and marginalized people and we must help them. I think if you look at the world, I would say that no one is safe until everyone is safe. So if we don't help the poorer regions of the world, like Africa, you know, deal with COVID-19, the problem in Africa will become a global problem, you know? So my, my, the, the general point I want to make is that it is in our self-interest. It is in our selfish interest to help poorer people, marginalized people, and poorer regions of the world 
and poorer countries. Because we live in one world, what happened next door will, will affect you. What happened in another part of the world will be transmitted to the rest of the world. Thank, thank you, Ambassador Ko. Uh, the next question is uh, from Dennis, a social entrepreneur also from Singapore. Our country is now rewriting the narrative of other ASEAN nations. Our people were told for a very long time that our ASEAN neighbors are backward and corrupt, but now as a result of aligned foreign policy and economic interests, we seem to be backtracking on the original narrative. Do you think that this narrative is too entrenched? I, I don't know where you, you got your narrative from, but it's certainly not my narrative. My narrative has always been that Singapore is part of Southeast Asia to the end of time. Our interest, our, our future is interlocked with those of our neighbors in the region. And I feel myself fortunate to be in Southeast Asia rather than somewhere else. You know, some Singaporean used to say that we, we are not in a good neighborhood. My question to them is, where would you rather be? I think all things considered, I think we're very lucky to be in Southeast Asia. This is a good region. It's a good region of countries which working hard to improve the lives and livelihoods of their people who are not seeking to make trouble against their neighbors, but trying to live peacefully and harmoniously with one another. My narrative to fellow Singaporeans is, we must pay more attention to ASEAN. We must learn ASEAN languages like Bahasa, like Thai, like Vietnamese, like Tagalog. We should trade more with other ASEAN countries, invest more in ASEAN, intern more in ASEAN, and do more things with ASEAN. So my narrative contrary to the one that this question student had is, our future is here in the region. We will be strong if ASEAN is strong. We will be, we will be well if ASEAN is well. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. And I think we are really um, now up to the, the last uh, questions. Um, last one question, maybe? Yes. Yeah. And it's, not, it's um, I think it would be from a, from a young person, Eti Sutrianti, uh, I think from, from Indonesia, I guess. Uh, what do you think about uh, job seekers from, from Asia? What do you think? job seekers uh, job seekers from asia um what do you think do they need to to improve um their chances to be able to to compete with you know other job seekers um in other countries and and, and regions young people I assume it's a young person. Yes. <laughs> um, i think um, I think many, many new jobs that will be created and are being created are related to the new economy. And, uh, and the new economy will be driven by, by uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, the internet. You know? So I, my advice to this young person is, in order to have good prospects for the future, he should acquire skills in these new areas where the opportunities will be. You know, he should be technically savvy. He should, um, he should have, have skills that will be sought after by the market uh, in, these, in these areas. Um, I think we are, we are at the end. Uh, I think we have uh, on the YouTube chat our uh, someone, what, our governor from Vietnam wants to uh, share his thoughts on on ASEM. Please, if you if you uh, for me to read it, 
ASIM should continue to be at the front lines to maintain world peace, stability, promoting dialogue, confidence building, and uphold international laws and norms of conduct. We have revitalized a modern agenda and a holistic approach for multilateral cooperation at all levels. The volatile and uncertain international environment makes Asia-Europe dialogue and cooperation much more a compelling necessity and ASEM more strategically and geopolitically relevant now more than ever. Therefore, ASEM should showcase its leading role in upholding multilateral cooperation and rules-based international order, as well as promoting connectivity and global efforts in leading with global challenges, including addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. From a uh, ASEF governor from from Vietnam and uh, and with, with with those thoughts uh, I pass yes yes please respond briefly to say that this is a very difficult year for Vietnam to be chairman of ASEAN you know where fiscal meetings are not possible everything has to be done online but in spite of the difficulty I want him to know that Vietnam had done a very good job as chairman. So he can be very proud of himself and his country for having led ASEAN well. And I think that ASEAN response to COVID-19 was very positive. Thank you, Ambassador Ko. And uh, on that note, I'm going to hand the floor back to, to Mr. Anderson. Um, Lawrence. The close of this uh, yeah. webinar. Um, Ambassador Ko, but thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure listening to your great insights you. into this and to seeing you again, thank you you. Know, and especially to hearing your views thank about you, the past, the present, thank and the future. You. So hopefully you can join us again for another session thank in the future. Happy yes. to do so. Happy to do so. I also want to thank our very attentive audience and all yeah. their questions that they have, yeah. and I hope that they've also enjoyed the yeah. webinar as much as you and I have enjoyed uh, doing this for them. So I'd like to also tell them that do follow us on social media, and please feel free to share this interview with your friends. Thank you once again, yeah. and a very good evening thank to you, all. Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you.